Now, when, now we get into the documentation part of, of SBA loans. It's uh, again a little bit different with 504 and 7A, uh, and, and but basically with both programs, uh, the the whole Bible uh, of of uh, or the whole roadmap, I should say, uh, which governs how you close a transaction is in uh, the context of the SBA authorization. And that gives, under 7A and 504, it, it gives the uh, authorization to participate in the, the program. Uh, with uh, 7A, the authorization is signed by the, uh, uh, the, uh, the particular lending official uh, of the organization if you have a delegated loan and it's signed by the SBA if it's, if it's a non-delegated loan. Uh, if it's uh, uh, a, five, if a 504 loan, it's, it's basically signed by the CDC and, and uh, the, 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 bar, the borrower. Uh, when, when we get into, you know, it's actually we're talking about that a little bit more on the, uh, on the next slide, uh, so, some, of the, some of the key things when you're dealing with the authorization it's it's that the the loan requirements should match the credit requirements. So, when even if SBA is approving the the, the loan and doing it a, a delegated, you really need to make sure that you know it, it it matches you know your credit requirements, your loan write up, and so forth, and uh, and of course your 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 loan commitment. They need to be all consistent. Uh, it, it's 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 real important that 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 you do even even on a delegated loan. If it doesn't really match what you have approved, or a non delegated loan, I should mean. Uh, it, you're going to have you're going to have some you know problem, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the authorization needs to be uh, followed very strictly. When, when you're lending in other jurisdictions, there's there's what they call, and you can find it on the SBA.gov. It's the National Authorization Boilerplate, and it sets forth all particular requirements uh, that are that are that are set forth in. Uh, 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 you know, various jurisdictions. So it's a very helpful tool to go to the National Authorization Boilerplate. All you have to do is Google that uh, or just go to sba.gov, and that will really give you an idea, if you're, particularly if you're lending in a jurisdiction that you're not quite familiar with. It will tell you the, 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 the particular requirements that you have to, to meet in a cer certain jurisdiction. Uh, for instance, uh, in Pennsylvania or Virginia or Ohio, they have confession of judgment provisions. Uh, you'll 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 find uh, find that designation, you know, in in the national boilerplate or certain collateral requirements uh, versus you know you have mortgage states, deed of trust states. It'll tell you some of the language that you need, uh, you know, whether certain states have homestead act rules and so forth. Uh, it's it's a wealth of information. So a good place, uh, you know, to to look at when you're documenting loans in different jurisdictions uh, on, on in a seven A basis is to go to the national authorization boilerplate. Just getting back to what we were before, and again, a lot of these loans—I mean, they're commercial loans. So a lot of the things you see here are, you know, they're they're, they're familiar. Uh, you just have to be, you know, closing these loans in, in the context of certain nuances of, of SBA loans. Title requirements are similar. The same kind of searches are similar. Uh, you have survey requirements, uh, and that's really, you know, what's what's what you deal with in your your, your local jurisdiction. Uh, Property, business approvals, uh, leases, construction, formation documents, SBA approvals, franchises. I mean, that's we're going to talk about that in more detail momentarily. And then, uh, you know, there's potential issues, uh, time-sensitive matters, and those really, you know, vary per, per, per jurisdiction. Okay. We talked about the authorization. Okay. Title requirements. Um, Again, this is uh, you know your you know your uh, lien uh, positions and insured amounts uh, need to be you know really pr you know in the context of prudent lending rules uh, generally the same way you would look at it in uh, 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 you know commercial commercial loan of, of financing. Be careful when you're doing a loan on a uh, on a uh, non-delegated basis. Uh, what we've been seeing lately is that uh, under the lo the loan authorizations that are produced by the centers. Uh, there, there's particular requirements that are generally not followed uh, in doing commercial loans or even uh, what, what delegated lenders do. So, for instance, uh, if you have, uh, you know, like subordinate lien positions required on certain collateral, uh, like third mortgages on a, on a house or an, or an ancillary piece of collateral, uh, you would not necessarily ordinarily get title insurance. You just really are looking for your lien position by, by a present owner search or, or so forth. What we've been seeing lately on the delegated 
authorizations, or excuse me, non-delegated authorizations that are produced by the SBA is that they're requiring title insurance on almost all types of properties. And uh, we've been having some issues with the centers on that. So if you're getting an authorization, you know, from one of the centers, you know, don't, don't assume that your credit write-up is going to follow the, the rules. You've got to make sure that when you're closing these loans, they really need to follow the authorization. Because when, you know, if there's a default, you know, you're going to be judged uh, by how, you, how well you followed that, that authorization. And then over that, you've got the, uh, the SOP. But, but basically, the basic requirements you have to meet are what, exactly what's set forth in that, uh, in that uh, loan authorization. Uh, you know, again, you know, it's typical title requirements. You've know, got to be aware of the current, current open you know, mortgages and restrictions of records. You know, you've got to make sure that they can utilize the property for the intended purpose. You need up-to-date searches, uh, you know, and the appropriate endorsements. And again, that varies for jurisdiction. Some, uh, and in, as many of you know, uh, the, the particular uh, endorsements you know, vary by state, and it's by state convention. What endorsements are allowed or are, are permitted or, or whatever, I guess, depends on how well the lobby of the insurance industry is, um, and, uh, and, 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 and taxes and so forth. Um, so one of the things I'll, I'll also comment on when we're dealing with personal property, uh, you know, the, you know with, with, with real estate title, I mean, you can insure your, your, your interest, uh, ensure your deed of trust, ensure your mortgage. Uh, with uh, with UCCs, you can't really do that so 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 readily. So I mean, you you do have the potential for uh, you know intervening liens uh, and so forth. So uh, it, it's our recommendation that you pre-file your UCCs uh, and uh, you know to to basically uh, you know prevent. Uh, uh, an intervening lien situation. It's not 100% foolproof. There's cer certain loopholes with pre-filing, but it does give you a pretty good jump and idea. Uh, you know, if you pre-file the UCC and do a search before you close to see that your lien position has been filed, you know, you can have a better argument that there was not an intervening, uh, you know, lien uh, s scenario. So you know, we always uh, always recommend you know to pre-file uh, you know UCCs. Searches. Now, searches again. This is more of an art than than, than anything. You know, prudent lending. You know, applies. Uh, I mean, searches can be you know very costly uh, when 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 documenting uh, an, an SBA loan. So you really have to drill down and you know weed out what what really is you know necessary. Uh, I mean, uh, in many cases, you know, certain lenders, you know, they they want us to go you know overboard you know with uh, these searches. Not sure you know completely what we're finding out about. But uh, and, and you know certain you know searches against guarantors and so forth, but uh, you know, they can be very costly. So you need to be careful, you know how you how you uh, how you order your searches. At the end of the day, it has to be reasonable and rational to the loan you're making. It has to be made under uh, prudent lending you know standards. Some of the typical searches that are that are done are your judgment searches, of course your UCC searches, uh, your pending litigation. Pending litigation is really important, uh, to, particularly with high-risk industries. You know, we always do those in biz acquisitions, uh, as well as, uh, you know, certain industries such as, you know, to restaurants, hotels, uh, you know, liquor stores, bars, etc. We'll always do a pending litigation search. You know, it depends. Also, you know, each you have to really know your jurisdiction. You know, where where judgments are filed, where you file your UCCs, etc. Also, whether or not uh, certain particular you know rules apply, such as franchise tax uh, considerations, you might have to do a fr franchise tax search. Always, you need to do flood search. Now, if your collateral is in a uh, uh, you, ha you have to prove, uh, you know, uh, where, where your collateral is located, uh, and you need to do a flood search. So if, even if you're renting facilities, if your collateral is the equipment, it's in that facility, you need to do a flood search. Uh, and the SBA is going to hold you accountable, and they're going to be looking for that, uh, for, that particular, for that particular flood search. So it's important to always get flood searches wherever your collateral is, is uh, 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 residing or placed. Uh, survey. Again, this is really by, uh, you know, custom, you know, where, uh, you know, if surveys are required, some areas of the country, surveys are not real big, some are real big, and then you get to the standard of whether an ALTA survey is required. That's always been a big debate, uh, and the one question that always comes to mind is, is an ALTA survey required uh, for an SBA loan? And the answer is yes or no. 
and that really depends on your, your, your jurisdiction and what kind of title insurance you can get. Um, so I would say, for instance, in, in, in my region of the country, uh, in most cases, Alta surveys are not required. And the reason why that's significant is Alta survey has a lot of extra requirements, with, which makes it very expensive to do. In New Jersey, New York, Alta surveys, Pennsylvania are very expensive. Uh, some parts of Pennsylvania, surveys are just not just not utilized. Uh, the eastern part of uh, Pennsylvania, the, uh, surveys, you, you can get survey affidavits of change. You don't have to get a survey. Western Pennsylvania, you always use surveys. So you really have to know your jurisdiction uh, as to surveys. But the, there is a uh, misconception out there that an ALTA survey is required for an SBA loan. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Okay. Uh, now, when you're talking about the property, the, the whole idea here is again, you know, prudent, prudent lending. And you got to make sure whatever you're, you know, you're, you know, you're using is going to be, be able to be used for the intended purpose. Okay. So, uh, and to the extent there's construction, you need to know that you know, and, and that, that the project is completed. I mean, I'm faced with a with a situation right now with a 504 loan, and one of the aspects of a 504 loan is uh, you have to have a completed project. Uh, to uh, to get financing, which is different than from a 7A. You don't necessarily have to have a completed project because they you know allow construction financing and so forth. 504 loans allow construction financing before you close on a uh, on an F, uh, on a 504 loan. But in order for the the, the 504 loan to take out uh, uh, the uh, uh, an interim position on a 504. Uh, you have to have a completed project, uh, and, and one of the ways to determine that is is whether you get a certificate of occupancy. I, I have a problem right now. One of the loans I'm closing on a 504 is that we have about four hundred thousand dollars worth of construction. The borrower is telling me that, uh, oh, we we you know we we we, we spent four hundred thousand dollars and uh, and no permits and approvals were required. Uh, the project was in New Jersey, where it's such a highly regulated state, so I find it highly unlikely that somebody spent $400,000 in construction, which, which included electric, roof repair, and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to have a big problem improving I have a completed project, so I cannot get a certificate of occupancy because they didn't take out any permits. So what we're going to have to do is send that borrower back to the, uh, to the building official and say, you know, beg for forgiveness and get a certificate of occupancy. But the, you know, these are some of the things that SBA is going to look for: is that that borrower can occupy that premises. Now, when you're dealing with a 7A, uh, if the loan was defaulted because the borrower couldn't ultimately occupy that building, they, they, uh, and we've seen that, you know, we've seen horror stories where I've been brought in uh, on a post-closing basis where the borrower could not use that facility. Uh, you're not going to have a guarantee. Uh, so you got to make sure when you're documenting these loans that the borrower can use that that that, that property and can use it for the you know the particular reason. Uh, that is generally determined by a certificate of occupancy. You might have to get a zoning letter, and, and in some jurisdictions you can actually insure your zoning position uh, for a reasonable cost. Uh, you know, in the Northeast, you know, you can get an opinion from a council and so forth, and a title insurance company will actually insure that the property can be used uh, for 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 zoning. Uh, you need to make sure that the business that you're providing financing to has appropriate licenses. Uh, we recently had a problem with a uh, dentist out of uh, Pennsylvania who was buying a New, Jer New Jersey practice, and but for some problems he had, he couldn't get licensed in New Jersey and didn't realize that he needed a, New a particular New Jersey license. And uh, we, we were able to determine, and we had to put a kibosh on that loan uh, because he didn't get, the, wasn't able to get the, pro the appropriate licensing. Again, if the if the the borrower cannot utilize that business and the loan defaults, you're not going to have a loan guarantee. Same thing with uh, you know whatever appropriate permits. You really have to go to your jurisdiction, uh, and again, you have to be able to utilize uh, the property, uh, be able to utilize the facility in accordance with uh, uh, the, the the loan approval. Uh, and if you can't, and loan defaults, you're going to have, a, have an issue. Uh, term compliance leases. Under the general rule, uh, the, the lease terms uh, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, particularly the EPC OC situation, which we talked about before, uh, the, the, the loan term, or the lease term has to be equal to the loan term. Uh, you also want to, you know, perhaps have get tenant estoppels, to make sure that the, the, the tenant, if, you, if there is subtenants, they don't have any superior rights if you have to foreclose. 
Uh, also, if you're dealing with leased facilities, a borrower's leasing facility, uh, it's important to obtain a landlord's non-interference uh, uh, agreements on your, on your property. SBA is going to look for that uh, because if you need to yank your collateral out of there, uh, if there's a loan default, if you're precluded from doing uh, so from the landlord, uh, landlord has a lien, SBA is going to give you, uh, uh, you know, a, a problem. Same thing with, uh, you know, when you're dealing with landlord uh, and tenant situations, uh, you might be looking at uh, subordination non-disturbance uh, agreements. Again, we're talking about prudent lending here. Uh, these are some of the requirements. Really no different than uh, in, a, in a commercial loan. You have to follow, um, you, know, prudent, you know, prudent lending standards and guidelines. Okay. Now we're dealing with construction. You need to obtain due diligence, uh, uh, whether it's 504 or, or 7A. Uh, you know, uh, again, pretty much following prudent lending standards. You want to ha have to make sure that there's an appropriate building contract, plans and specifications. If there's construction, permits and approvals. Got to make sure that they can, you know, proceed and ultimately get a CO. Get particular contractor insurance, and uh, there is, uh, you know, performance bond requirements. Uh, if there's a construction component of over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, now pr performance bonds can be uh, difficult to uh, obtain, or they can be very expensive to maintain, and can be a time factor. So SBA has recognized a, uh, a, a a waiver of the performance bond if the lender can uh, provide for independent monitoring of the construction cost. So you, if if it's not, it can't be an employee of the bank can't be an affiliate of the bank, uh, but they can go out there. Uh, but if you hire a consultant, an independent consultant, to manage the, uh, the construction of the project, disperse the funds, uh, you can uh, uh, have a, a waiver of the performance bond requirement, uh, which is always required over $350,000. Uh, a lot of you know it's it's unfortunate that you know so, some sophisticated lenders have you know really great construction departments with really great construction people, but uh, with SBA it has to be independent or you have to get a, 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 spe a special approval from SBA if you're going to use your department. I've never seen that given, but uh, I mean the general rule is you have to go for independent uh, 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 monitoring of a construction project. Uh, also, some of the things you're looking for, and S particularly SBA is going to look for this uh, uh, on a 504 loan uh, as, as well as a 7A, is lien waivers. So if you're paying a contractor, uh, you want to make sure that they're not going to go around and file a mechanics lien on the property. And so to the extent they're being paid for work done, they need to be able to uh, waive liens to the extent of that work was d done. Many jurisdictions, you know, some lenders try to get blanket waivers, uh, but that's, uh, you know, against public policy in most jurisdictions and most courts will, will basically say that uh, they, they can waive a lien to the extent of the work that was done and to the extent of the work that was paid. Uh, and again, when you're dealing, dealing with title insurance, you want to make sure, keep in mind with title insurance, your title insurance only extends to the amount of uh, loan that was dispersed at the time uh, uh, of, of closing and, and subsequent disbursements. So in other words, uh, if you have a construction project, you bought the property, for, say for a million dollars, there's a million dollar construction component, uh, you go to advance another $100,000, you better make sure you have a lien waiver otherwise, and, and also notify your title company that you've just advanced another $100,000, otherwise your title insurance would only be up to the, the million dollar amount and not for future disbursements. Uh, most title companies are going to tell you to get a, a lien waiver. I'm telling you, you have to get a lien waiver to, to prove to the SBA that you did that, particularly in 504 transactions. Okay, formation documents, basic due diligence. You really need to know who owns these companies. Uh, that's uh, you know an important aspect here. Uh, you know, basically, you're looking for your certificate of formation. That's key to to you know to how you do your loan documents. Uh, you know, now under the new Article Nine rules, you use that organic public record rule, which is the, basically determined on the formation documents. Uh, you have to use the name exactly uh, as it's set forth in order to to perfect your liens on Article Nine. But it's a best practice to have all your documents. Uh, listing the name exactly. A lot of times, your your uh, 
your, your, owner, your operating documents, like your operating agreement, your um, partnership agreements, they may refer to the name slightly differently of the company as it appears on the certificate of incorporation. Maybe corp is abbreviated or a corporation is spelled out. But on your loan documents, uh, it's a best practice that whatever is set forth uh, in the certificate of formation accepted by or certificate of incorporation or whatever organizational document that's filed with the state, which is known as the organic public record, your, all your documents should, should cite the name exactly uh, as it's set forth. That's the same rule that you should apply with whether it be uh, you know, SBA or uh, with uh, you know, your commercial, commercial you know, loan requirements. Again, it's prudent lending, uh, you know, requires, uh, you know, there, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's really the standard that you go by. You know, same rule with, with corporations, really need to, uh, you know, know who owns the company, uh, you get copies of stock certificates, know your ownership structure. It's a lot, it's a little bit harder uh, to, to determine ownership in a corporation as it is a, uh, an LLC. We tend to use incumbency certificates, we tend to get copies of stock certificates, we get copies of stock uh, ledgers to know who, who actually owns that, that company. Uh, uh, you know, again, uh, ownership counts uh, in a big way, particularly with SBA lending. Uh, if, if there's a 20% or uh, more ownership interest of an individual, uh, that has to be th that individual has to guarantee the loan. That's an absolute requirement under both programs. Um, uh, you, you'll also see sometimes uh, if you know somebody before closing they want to shuffle the deck a little bit. Somebody wants to change their ownership interest. There is a six-month look-back rule. Uh, so uh, it, it, to the extent that uh, somebody changes ownership before we close. Uh, on a transaction, uh, they're going to be subject to those guarantee requirements, notwithstanding they change their ownership interest to below uh, the 20% amount. So keep in mind that uh, th those are those rules out there as well. If uh, you have somebody you know shuffling the deck a little bit, somebody gets cold feet, they don't want to have a, a guarantee. You can't uh, change the guarantee so so quickly. Uh, there has, there's, a, there's a certain cooling off period. Uh, also, when we're dealing with these. Uh, uh, transactions, it's important to do added due diligence. These loans are, uh, you know, you're, you're oftentimes you're dealing with, uh, because they are small businesses, you're, you're kind of, you're, in many odd cases you're dealing with unsophisticated borrowers and uh, uh, and sometimes you have to do added due diligence that otherwise a borrower would have to do uh, or should be doing, and that's doing due diligence on the selling entities. And that's, you know, we, so we always do searches on the selling entities as, as, as well to make sure that, you know, there's, and we do searches on the selling entities to make sure that, you know, there's not going to be uh, any liens that, uh, uh, you know, are inherited by the, uh, the, the purchasing uh, entity. So it's always a good tip, uh, particularly in, in SBA loans, to do that added amount of uh, uh, due diligence on the selling, selling entities. Uh, with insurance, uh, you know, you, you got to get your proper designations and proper coverages. Uh, I'll have to tell you, uh, you know, on, on, in the past several years, you know, Accord forms, which were generally acceptable forms in the industry, and they were done in conjunction, you know, with the banking industry and the insurance industry to make it, make it easier to do things, they basically have whittled away the value of an Accord uh a certificate to the point where they're basically useless to give you a summary of policy terms. Uh, you really need to be getting your full policies. Uh, not, it's not a requirement, but it's a good pr best practice to get your copy of your policy uh, to, to make sure that you have the appropriate coverage. It's nice to get an accord form, which gives you a little summary of it, but you really need to make sure that your, your policy uh, incorporates the provisions that are summarized in an accord form, which really have no binding legal value anymore. They used to. They don't anymore. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what accord you get. Uh, it could be a piece of paper, whatever. They really don't have a lot of value to them, uh, other than they're easy to read. Uh, and you need to have your appropriate designations. When you're dealing with real estate, uh, the lender needs to be named as mortgagee uh, or lender loss payee. It's important to use that word lender. That, that really ensures uh, the lender against acts of the, that the borrower might commit. Uh, and, to, and to the extent you can get it, you know, your additional insured provisions. You need to get the appropriate insurance, uh, you know, hazard, contents, liability, professional liability, workers' comp. You know, we can talk about that in, in, in great detail. Uh, life insurance, we'll talk about that quickly. Uh, for loans under $350,000, uh, it's, it's the bank's policy that governs. 
So if the bank doesn't have any policy on life insurance, it's not required for loans under 350. For loans 350 and over, uh, if the loan is not uh, uh, fully secured, life insurance is going to be required on the uh, principles of the business, uh, and it's important to get copies of the policies, uh, collateral assignments, uh, and making sure that those collateral assignments are recorded uh, you know, in the home office. Uh, if a, if a, if a, there's, there's some open interpretation that if there is a borrower that is a principal that's not insurable, uh, if you document it, uh, you don't necessarily have to get insurance. Uh, however, you know, the SBA looks at it, if, if, if there was a, a default on a loan because of the death of a principal and there wasn't life insurance, they're going to hold it against you. So it's, that's, that's really kind of a catch-22 situation. Uh, again, we, we talked about the, the various approvals. We talked about the authorization. You know, you've got to follow, you know, uh, you know your, your various requirements with uh, appraisals, environmental, uh, no adverse change. And we talked a little bit about injection at the, early, at the outset of the program. And again, that could be a whole course in and of itself. But that, that's a very important aspect to the extent that uh, with a 7A loan, that there is, uh, you know, injection required, uh, capital injection. There's a rebuttable presumption that, that if you don't prove it, uh, and, and there's a default within the first 18 months, that was the uh, the, the reason for the the, the uh, failure of the business for lack of capital. Uh, recently, we'll talk about franchises a little bit here. Uh, with franchises, uh, there's been some very recent changes, uh, and the, under the old rules. SBA determined that everything was a franchise. Now they're using the FTC definition, which is less broad than the previous rules. The problem that causes is some some franchises you really can't tell whether there's a, whether there's a franchise or not, uh, uh, and uh, that that puts it on the lender to to make that determination, which can be difficult uh, in order to be eligible. Uh, so and the, the, the appropriate documentation you need to obtain is. Uh, the franchise disclosure document, the FDD, and the franchise agreement with addendums uh, in compliance with the SBA rules. So that franchise ad agreement, you need to have those signed agreements and FDD in place before closing. A lot of franchisors push back on that, but it's going to be at your peril that you, if you don't have those documents uh, at, at the time of closing, it's going to be on you if you don't ultimately get them. The big change that I'll mention now is that uh, in order to be eligible for SBA financing on, on a franchise, uh, the franchisor must sign a word-for-word, a, a -word, uh, without any modification or negotiation, a universal franchise addendum that's produced by the SBA. And uh, that's, that's set forth in the new SOP. Uh, to the extent that a franchisor will not sign it, you cannot do the loan. That's a big change. There's a lot of franchisors now that will not sign them. Uh, I've been told that Dunkin' Donuts will not sign them, and they traditionally had been a very big SBA lender. Uh, they may get a lot of pushback, and they may change their mind, but right now SBA is not changing that one word, and to the extent that you do not get that universal franchise addendum, you cannot do the loan, and that gets into you know, ownership controls and so forth. One, one useful tool that many lenders used uh, in the past was on the franchise registry. That's not going away. That, that will still be a useful tool that will help you determine whether a franchise is, in fact, a franchise under the FTC rules and whether, in fact, you know, it is eligible under and, and whether, in fact, they will sign the addendum. So it's still a, uh, and that's by Frandata. That's an outside service. Uh, they provide that registry access to lenders for free. And so I, you know, I suggest that uh, you still utilize you know, the franchise registry. Other some of the potential issues uh, and so forth, you have uh, you know, your bulk sales requirement, which are really uh, successor liability uh, uh, tax you know, things or tax liabilities that, that uh, taxes of a seller are imposed on a, uh, uh, on a purchaser. It, it varies from state. That, that's, that's spreading across the country, so you need to be aware of your bulk sale provisions, and I'm talking about uh, tax uh, liability. Uh, you know reasons. Also, you know we talked about life insurance, and you really need to know your state-specific requirements uh, in order to close these loans and, and you know close loans under local custom and, and so forth. 